And we have to leave time for my travel slide. So we're going back to Copenhagen again, where the best way to see Copenhagen is on these tourist boats that, that go underneath all the bridges and around the whole city because it's all full of canals. But like any other European city, there's museums and there's palaces and there's places all over the place that are there. Doctor, good of you to join us. So this, is, this was when we were looking for the National Museum, and as we were wandering through this complex where there were museums everywhere, we stumbled upon this, this one door and came in, and it's the National Museum of, of War and Armaments for Copenhagen, for Denmark. And so it's the strangest thing I've ever seen. This building's like 200 yards long, and as far as you can see, they've got every cannon from, you know, 1500, um, along this side, and then all the way to World War II along this side. And then they've got this interesting story about, you know, Denmark and World War II, and that the Nazis did invade Denmark, and, and the war lasted about six hours. And so seriously, so, you know, the Nazis came in and bombed the hell out of them and put a bunch of tanks across, and then the Danes said, okay, okay, it, we're done, good, 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 we're okay, come on in. And so that's what, what this exhibit was about. But I had no idea. You go up to the top floor, and they basically talk about you know, the warfare history for, uh, you know, for 400 years. And in the Northern Baltic, there was a war like every eight years for 400 years. And again, I had no idea. You know, Denmark and Sweden and Russia and Britain, and, and you know, they were just, there was wars about every eight to 10 years. And so as you go through, you'll see that there's um, carvings of ships, and, 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 and again, you can see how far it goes, it's literally 200 yards long, and so we were there and there were four of us in there. It was interesting, we had the, the whole place to ourselves. <laughs> Just kind of stumbled on it, said, oh, this is a cool museum, look, cannons, you know, ships. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna talk about lids today. And, you know, lids, like anything else in the eye, have layers, layers. exactly, so. Layers and so, oh, good. This is a good, a good intern. Uh, sorry, intern questions. So, what are the layers of the lid? The skin. Okay, the skin. The tarsus, the orbicularis. Okay, we got to go in sorry, order orbicularis. from front to back. So, skin. What's underneath skin? Orbicularis. Orbicularis. Mm -hmm. Okay, orbicularis, and then underneath that. The tarsus. Tarsus, and then the inside. Conjunctive. Exactly. So we always forget that the conjunctiva lines the inside of the eyelid, but it does. The palpebral conj lines it. So then, as we look at a little bit closer power, how is this picture different than the previous one? Uh, stain. Okay, the stain. That's one difference. Another one? Let's see if you guys are awake. It's upside down. All right, just seeing if you're paying attention. All right, so let's see, did you pay attention last week? What kind of stain is this? h &E and stain. Actually, this is what's called a trichrome. And the way you can tell it is trichrome stains stain epithelial tissue, they stain muscle and uh, tissue red, they stain connective tissue blue. And so that's why I'm purposely showing this. So, when we look at this, as we're looking right here at, at low power, again, you can see the layers, skin, orbicularis, tarsus, note all the connective tissue in the tarsus, conjunctiva, and then underlying that is cornea. All right, so Lee, we're looking kind of at the first couple layers here. Tell me about the skin of the eyelid. So it's uh, stratified, um, squamous, keratinized uh, epithelium with uh, connective tissue and, and there's um, muscular tissue underneath that. Okay, now in terms of the skin, how is the skin of the eyelid different from skin elsewhere in the body? It's thinner. It's thinner? Um, and there are not a lot of reedy ridges. Exactly. So when you have skin elsewhere in the body, you see these reedy ridges and pegs going through, but you look at the skin of the eyelid, it's relatively smooth. What's another difference between skin of the eyelid and skin elsewhere in the body? Um, I know it's staring at me right now, but I can't. Eyelid skin does not have dermis. Dermis, that's right. 
So elsewhere in the body, there's dermis underneath the skin, and there's fat, and, and you know, eyelid skin doesn't have dermis, it's just got this loose connective tissue, so it's very, very loose. It's not tightly adherent to the tissue underneath it, like skin elsewhere in the body. All right, uh, Tara, so what is this right here? That's uh, orbicularis. Orbicularis, and, and what are the three different parts of the orbicularis muscle when we divide it, you know, grossly? Uh, there's the uh, pre... There's the tarsal portion, pre-tarsal. Okay, pre-tarsal. Preceptal. Preceptal, good. And the, oh, I can't think of the third one. The last one's just like an orbital part. Orbital. Because, so if you think about it, the, the orbicularis muscle, it's shaped almost like a Chicago Bear C, you know, that comes in immediately like this. And then you've got the, the part of it in front of the tarsus, the pretarsal, the front part of it that's in front of the orbital septum, and then finally a third one that's furthest out, you know, almost underneath the you know, the eyebrows there. And so it's got three layers in. The thing about the orbicularis muscle is it runs this way, as opposed to the levator muscle, which runs, you know, this way. So it's different. It runs that way. So when you look at a cross-section of the eyelid, you actually see, you know, sagittal section of the lid, you actually see the orbicularis in cross-section. When you're saying those three layers, you're saying from superficial to deep, right? No, no. Actually, zones, I may maybe say, from the margin of the eyelid to the, you know, orbit. Okay. So like, like this. Not deep, but, but layers where they're, you know, zones. Maybe you can think of it that way. All right, so Jason, what are we looking at here now? It's like the tarsal plate. Okay. Tell me about the tarsal plate in, in primates. What is it made of? A lot of dense connective tissue. Exactly. How is the tarsal plate in primates different from the tarsal plate in lower animals? No idea. Cartilage. And it's interesting in that you look at bunnies, you look at rats and all that, they have cartilage in their tarsal plate. It's extremely strong, but humans don't, and nor primates. And so it's just it's dense irregular connective or dense regular connective tissue. It's a very dense connective tissue. And then what are these right here? It's like uh, sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands, and what do we call them? Mybomian glands. The mybomian glands, all right. You can see how the, the pattern you want to think about, it's almost like grapes that are growing. And so what you'll see is you'll see clusters of these mybomian glands on a central trunk, which is a mybomian um, duct. And so these ducts come down and they dump out right at the posterior surface of the eyelid. And so there'll be a series of these mybomian glands. The reason that these are important is when they get plugged up. Wow, this isn't even good evening. This is good night. So, so you can see, so again, lecture starts at seven, unless you are in the ER putting an eyeball back into the head, be here at seven. Uh, if you have traffic, get up 10 minutes earlier, okay? So again, I get, if you want to piss off an attending, make him get up at 5.30 and then don't show up. So that's it. So if I'm up, you guys darn well better be up. All right, so they dump into a central duct here and they empty out right on the posterior aspect of the lid margin, so we look right there. All right, what are we looking at right here, um, Reese? Glands. Okay, what kind of glands? Um, Reese, are my booming glands? All right, look more closely. Eccrine. Exactly, these are eccrine glands. So, the lids are the one place in the body where all three types of glands are present, and you guys are gonna Hear these until you're sick of them. Oh, God, glands again. Oh. So these are eccrine glands. And so what are examples of eccrine glands? In Sweat the glands. Sweat glands, but also in the eye itself, the or around the eye. Lacrimal. The lacrimal glands, exactly. So these are eccrine glands. And when you look at them, they have this round acinar pattern, meaning that the glands um, line up in a circle here, and then they go into this little central lumen, and eventually those all gather in into ducts. And so eccrine glands are sweat glands. Believe it or not, there are sweat glands in the eyelid. I know we forget about that, but there really are. So eccrine glands are the sweat glands and they're the lacrimal glands. Now the reason I like the lid margin is because the lid margin is a very, very busy area. It's got examples of all kinds of glands. And so if you look, this is the anterior surface. It's got this keratinized 
shut up and swim and sit in the field and you look at the keratin goes all the way back to the posterior edge of the lid. The reason that that's important is if you get entropion, the eyelid rolling in, first of all, the lashes can scratch on the cornea, but even beyond the lashes, this keratinized epithelium can scratch on the cornea. So this shows you where the meibomian glands dump in. Here's the orbicularis muscle, and then these are where the hair follicles are, and they come out right here. So we're gonna go a little bit higher power. Now, here we have an eyelash, a hair follicle, and then we've got a couple of different glands sitting here on the eyelash follicle. So we'll go ahead and, and Dr. Bernheisel, what kind of glands are we looking at right in here? Those. Here's a high power. Oh, it's an apocrine gland. It's an apocrine gland. And how do you tell apocrine glands? Because they have snouts. Exactly. So apocrine glands have snouts. Here's the snout sticking out. Those little apical projections that are sticking out. And how do we remember the name of the apocrine glands in the eyelid? Because they're like little snouts of moles. Like moles. So you mispronounce it. The glands of mole because moles have snouts. So that's how you remember them. So these African glands, they literally chop off their snouts, and then their snouts fall into the lumen here. And so these are an interesting gland. They're, they're thought to be a scenting gland in other animals. And, and you know, animals like you know, deer have got these all over. And you look at deer, not only do they like urinate on things, but they rub their inner eye on twigs and branches, and this stuff from the African glands scents. And so humans have evolved to the point where we don't have many left, but for some reason, these glands sit in the, you know, in the eyelash follicles, so we can still kind of, you know, set ourselves with our eyelids there. So. I need to use that more often. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so these are the apocrine glands of mole. And then, so uh, the eccrine glands are the zeiss. No. No. Which ones are zeiss? No. Uh, that's. Oh. Oh. That was my next question to Dr. Conrad. <laughs> what are the glands of Zeiss made out of? They're holocrine. They're holocrine glands, exactly. And so if you look at a holocrine gland, what denotes the holocrine glands is they've got this central nucleus, and they've got this foamy-looking cytoplasm. The reason why it looks foamy is because it's filled with lipid. I mean, sebum is lipid. And so sebaceous-type glands look like this. And we already said that the meibomian glands are one and the zeiss are the other. And so the zeiss glands also dump into the eyelash follicles. And so in the, you know, in the lid, you've got all three. You've got eccrine glands, you've got apocrine glands, and you've got holocrine glands. Now, when the apocrine glands secrete, they cut off their snouts and it goes into the lumen. These guys are interesting because when you look at, the reason they call these holocrine glands is they give their hole to the secretion. So when these guys, um, secrete, they literally regurgitate all of their contents into the lumen and then reform again. And so these guys literally, it's like when you've had too much, two carbon chains and if you ever notice that, that um, you know, um, when you have too many two carbon chains and you suddenly get religious and you're sitting there holding onto the porcelain and you're saying, oh God, make me through this and I'll never drink again. And what happens in that setting is you are pretty much regurgitating all of your contents. I mean, there's like intestines coming out and everything else, and that's how these guys secrete. They just regurgitate all of their stuff into the lumen. So that's why they call them holocrine. They give their whole. Can you go back a couple slides? I was just wondering if that one, what, is, that, exactly. is that a zeiss right there? This yeah. is a gland of zeiss dumping into the hair follicle. And then these are the glands of mole also dumping into that hair follicle. So exactly, so they're all there to the margin. And what kind of stain is this, Chris? Lipid retinol. Right, close. Uh, I mean, uh, oil retinol. Oil retinol. Yeah. And what do we have Stains to do in order to get this stain? What do it we have to do? Fresh section. It has to be fresh. And so this is a fresh section where we're looking for a sebaceous carcinoma or bimobian gland carcinoma, and you can see it's easy to remember because it stains the oil, these little red O's. So oil red O stain is a fresh stain for lipid. All right, let's start looking at some various lid lesions. Nico, what are we seeing here? So it's a external photograph of the right eye. Um, my attention's drawn to the lower um, eyelid margin. There seems to be like a raised uh, lesion there. Um, this could be uh, just eye, could be basal cell carcinoma, um, external aureolum. Yeah, 
So the key is you've got to think of a pretty broad differential diagnosis when you see kind of a bump on the middle of the eyelid. And so you want to look for several features. You want to say, have the eyelashes fallen out? I mean, is there lots of lashes here? Is Maybe there's not a Now, what else can you tell me about this patient? Um, the upper eyelid seems to be kind of swollen as well, with swollen. kind of a this was Dr. Conrad's last surgery, and up the anterior chamber IOL here. <laughs> it's in there. So, all right. Now here's a, a different one. How is this one a little bit different than that one? Um, so there seems to be like multiple lesions uh, in the left eye too that I can count. Uh, there's more loss of lashes medially. Deal. How uh, old is this patient? Younger than the last patient. Yeah, so it's a pretty young years. patient if you look at it. Here's a young patient, multiple little lesions right here. And when you ask them, you say, How long has this been here? Well, been here a few weeks, it kind of comes up, it kind of goes down, but it still doesn't go away. And this is what you see on the pathology. So I see. Laboratory cells like lymphocytes. Okay. Um, I also okay. see. Which cell is that right there? Like a, is that a giant cell? Exactly. There's a giant cell. And look at all these little white foamy spaces here. Those aren't artifacts. Those had the, the medium of stuff in them. Those had what dissolves normally when we process our. Lipid. Lipid, yeah, so that had lipid in it. So this lesion has got little lipid droplets all over. It's got giant cells here and epithelioid cells and a few lymphocytes. So what is this lesion? It's a chalazion. exactly. So chalazion is a lipogranulomatous inflammation. So what happens is, is the chalazion ducts get plugged, the lipid backs up as it starts to go into the tissue. Lipid is very irritating and will um, you know, induce this granulomatous inflammation. So this is what we see normally in a chalazion. And here's a close-up. This is really a giant, giant cell. I mean, it looks like an amoeba right here. This is a huge giant cell. And look at the lipid droplets all over. So this is a chalazion, lipogranulomatous inflammation, probably one of the most common lid lesions that we see. All right, now what are we seeing right here? We'll start back, back to you, Charlotte. What are we seeing right here? Mm -hmm. so, on the left side, there's an upper eyelid lesion. It's not on the, it's abutting the margin, but it's on the lid itself, on the skin. Um, looks, there's no like hair on it. Um, it looks pretty um, consistent in its texture. All right, what's, what's a little simple thing we could do sitting right there in the chair to tell us about the qualities of this lesion? Like measurements? Well, if, if you look at it, it almost looks kind of tight as if there's like something inside of there pushing it out as if this were a cis instead of solid. So what's a quick way we could tell if something solid or cystic? Exactly. You put a, a, the light with the fan on head on it, you just shine it on there, and you'll see the light will illuminate through if it's a cyst. So some of the hints that it's a cyst, or you see again, it's like, again, like a balloon, like somebody is, is just, you know, inflating it and pushing it out. And sure enough, oh man, that must have been the, the picture that Jason took, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was some kind of focus, so. This is his Good last shot, picture. <laughs> So when we look at a cyst, the most important thing we want to look at is we want to, sorry, see. we have to see you guys. So we need to look at the cyst lining and see what the lining of the cyst is. So working at this at low power, what kind of a lining are we seeing here?
actually consists of stratified squamous. And so it looks just like skin, basically. And in fact, if you look on the inside, this eosinophilic staining stuff here is actually keratin. And so another common thing that we see in the eyelids are what we call epithelial inclusion cysts. And for some reason, either for trauma or surgery or whatever, some surface epithelium gets implanted underneath. And when it does, it tends to round up. And then the epithelium keeps growing, and it keeps making material like keratin. And so it'll, it'll keep growing. And so this is an epithelial inclusion cyst. And here's a close-up. Stratified squamous epithelium, look at all the keratin. And so epithelial inclusion cysts, very common in the All right, Lee. What we see in here. So this is an external film of the right eye. Um, see, I copied this out of someone. I just didn't have any. I should get one from Willow, but I don't have one. So there appears to be a lateral campal um, nodule or, or round nodule that's non erythematous It's um, <coughs> looks like maybe cystic in nature. Yeah, exactly, so that kind of looks cystic also. Now we look at the lining, what's the lining of this cyst? So it's uh, cuboidal, bilayer cuboidal. Okay, so bilayer cuboidal, what kind of cysts are bilayer cuboidal? Ecrin cyst. Ecrin, and what do you call it? Ecrin hydrocystoma, exactly. From what language? Greek. From the Greek. <laughs> Hydro means water, you know, cyst, cyst, water filled cyst. Mm -hmm. Hydrocystoma. So, very common, these are benign cysts. Some people call these eccrin ductal cysts, but mm -hmm. it might be derived from one of the eccrin gland ducts, but it's a bilayer cuboidal you know, epithelial lining, so eccrin hydrocystoma. And so if we have an eccrin hydrocystoma, we can also have, what's the difference between this one and that one here? Um, so there's no keratin, so this would be uh, sebum or well, actually, look at look at the surface here. Uh, uh, that's a mole. Yeah, so it's got snouts. So you can not only have an eccrine you can have hydrocystoma, you can have an apocrine hydrocystoma. Now, eccrine glands are much more common than apocrine glands, and so eccrine hydrocystomas are more common. Apocrine hydrocystomas are very rare, but again, you can still get even apocrine hydrocystoma. The difference is the snouts. So there you see all the snouts that are there. All right, uh, Tara. So on the upper eyelid margin, it looks like kind of more medially there's um, kind of a raised nodule or lesion on uh, near the tarsal border, and um, <coughs> there's disruption of the la lashes. But if you look, though, oh, look at all of them. Yeah. The whole cluster of these guys. Focusing more on these guys right here, what do you make of the, you know, the, the configuration of those little lesions? Um, Jeff Taven's favorite lesion. <laughs> you know, actually, you probably haven't rotated with him now because oh. he's not around anymore. But. Um, they're kind of. They're Sosmans. They're flatter and uh, like not as cystic. See, if you look at them, they've almost got this little umbilicated center. So they've got these kind of raised pearly edges, and then the center umbilicates a little bit, and there's a cluster of them. So whenever you see a cluster, you think of something maybe infectious. Mm -hmm. And they've got this pearly raised edge, and they've got this little indented uh, center. And when you look at the pathology, it looks like this. So what, what, what is this lesion? Is this molluscum? Exactly, this is molluscum contagiosum. So, not from the Greek, from what? The Russian, um. from the, yeah. <laughs> from the Latin. Um, you know, contagiosum literally means contagious. And so this is, is thought to be viral induced. And when you look at these, you'll see they tend to have the raised pearly edges, the umbilicated center. The epithelium is markedly thickened, but look at all these eosinophilic inclusions. And you look at a close-up, Basically what happens is, is the virus starts taking over the cells and it'll start making, making viruses, making viruses, and by the time it comes to the surface, it literally 
pushes the nucleus out of the cell. And you're left with just a bag of viruses. And then they dump out on the surface, which is why you have a cluster of them. And so it'll start with one, and then it'll end up with a whole cluster. These are kind of fun to take out, because you can literally just kind of core them out. You, just, you numb it up and just core the things out. But you've got to be careful, because you can spread this. You know, if you're trying to take this out and you're grabbing it with a forcep and then grab somewhere else, you can actually spread this yourself. So be really careful when you're moving these, because these are indeed viral induced. And so nothing else looks like this. When you see this, it's like, OK, molluscum contagiosa. So just to warn you guys who haven't taken OCAPs yet and, and boards eventually, they ask two-part questions. So they'll show a picture of this, and you'll say, ah, molluscum, I knew that. I studied hard. And then they'll say, OK, a person with this lesion would have an infection with what? And then they'll list you like four different viruses. You know, like, oh, shit, what virus is it? So they ask two-part questions, which is, which is no fun. So you have to not only know what the pathology is here, but you have to know what the common viruses are that cause this. All right, so we're looking right here, Jason. It's a little external photograph of both eyes. On the right upper medial lid, looks to be a, kind of a whitish raised circular lesion. It doesn't really appear cystic, just based on what we can see here. And it's definitely um, far away from the lid margin. So this looks almost sebaceous to me. Just Externally. It kind of looks almost yellow white. Yeah. I mean, it looks kind of lippity, li lippity, if that's a word, you know? And then we look at the pathology, and you see all these foamy macrophage looking cells sitting in here. So I would say it's like sebaceous hyperplasia? Actually, no, because the sebaceous glands actually form a specific glandular pattern. This okay. is just like the macrophages came in and are gobbling up a bunch of lipid that's deposited there. So this is called xanthelasma. Okay. And you see these very commonly in old people. It's, it's kind of a flat, plaque-like, yellowish looking thing. And what it's characterized by is these lipid field uh, macrophages. Now the reason you don't see any of these in the path lab so far in the last six months is because we don't usually remove these and send them to the paths. But this is called a xanthelasma. It's another just kind of a common benign lesion of the lens. All right, Reese. Um, so this lower eyelid is kind of an elevated lesion just below the lid margin. Um, it's a, maybe it looks kind of papillomatous. Exactly. So it looks kind of bumpy. It looks kind of papillomatous. And we look at the path, and indeed, it's papillomatous. Exactly. So you see the fingers sticking out. So the papilloma is the gloved hand. Gloved hand. And so it's thickened epithelium, like a glove, with little fibrovascular cores in the middle, but sticking out. And so you can see these areas of thickened epithelium, little fibrovascular core in the center sticking out. Lots of keratin. So these have got hyperkeratin. On them, they've got keratin-filled cysts, keratin-filled crypts, and so this is a papilloma. They can be infectious or they can be non-infectious, either one. And here's a close-up. Again, look at the little center here, a little fibrovascular core, thick end acanthotic epithelium. So while we're here, some skin path terms that you guys have to know. So a thickened keratin layer is hyperkeratosis. If you have keratin deeper where it shouldn't be, down here in the bottom of the epithelium, what do we call that? Dyskeratosis with a DYS. Um, actually, what do we call it when the epithelial layer itself is thickened? Acanthosis. Acanthosis. Okay, so acanthosis, thickening of the, especially the prickly cell layer, hyperkeratosis, dyskeratosis. What is parakeratosis? Actually, that's where you have the nuclei all the way to the surface. And so you know, normally you don't have it. Now, here's a close-up of what this would look like in cross-section. So this is if you took the gloved hand and you chopped all their fingers off. And you look at them. So here's the chopped fingers. And this is what these look like in cross-section. Little fibrovascular core, thickened epithelium surrounding it. 
All right, so this is, sorry, I shouldn't ask you to, but actually, that didn't count in that first one. So what do we see in here? So this is uh, a skin lesion that's elevated, lumpy, kind of greasy appearing. It's like it's maybe stuck on. Okay, so what would this be likely? Um, that's right, but the vet, every vet has these, by the way. This is, um, As soon as the spotlight hits, I know it's like. <laughs> so you're going to be an oral board. You're going to be saying now. You're thinking, okay, Harry Spider, Harry Spider. This is a seborrheic keratosis. So it, it's greasy. It's keratinized. Now a couple of differences. It kind of looks like a papilloma, except the fingers go down instead of in. So it's like the. Hairy spider as opposed to the gloved hand, they go down. And the other thing is, look at the pigment in the base of the layer. Oftentimes, these will have a little bit of pigment in the base of the layer, so they will look tan or brown instead of, you know, flesh. And so they'll often have a little bit of a brownish keratinization. But they'll get really hyperkeratotic, and these old vets will tell you, oh, yeah, I had this thing, but then it fell off and then it grew back. And so literally, you'll get a big keratin plaque and the plaque will fall off. And then the keratin will build up again over time. And so these are really hyperkeratotic. And you can see that there's this increased pigmentation along the base of our layer. It gives these kind of a brownish tan appearance. When you see these, it'll often be brownish tan. All right, Nico, what are we looking at right here? So it's an external photograph. Um, and in the lower eyelid, you see kind of this small, yellowish, irregularly shaped raised um, lesion. All right, we look at the path on this one. Kind of looking like a, almost like a seborrheic keratosis, lots of keratin in here. But look at the epithelium. What's different with this epithelium here? Can you come closer if you need to? So first, in the epithelium is like acanthotic, okay. it's thickened. It's acanthotic, it's thickened. Um, the, there's, it's like elevated as well. There seems to be the kind of a central kind of lumen that's extending upwards. So there's the little fingers going up. Yeah. For rescue tissue. What is this thing right here? Are those like nuclei? Yeah. Well, nuclei. Ovi in nuclei. So if you look at this, these little nuclei are more active than usual. They've got little nucleoli in them. And so this epithelium is starting to get active. But look right there. What is that thing right there? It was a mitotic figure. Yeah, it's even a little mitotic figure in here. So the epithelium is starting to get active. What is going on down here? It's kind of like this grayish. Solar exactly. So this is what we call basophilic degeneration. It's a solar-induced degeneration. So these are on sun-exposed skin. And so this is what we call an actinic keratosis. And so this is kind of a pre-malignant. It's a pre-cancer. It's not quite cancerous yet, but you're starting to see a lot of sun-induced damage, basophilic degeneration of collagen. You're seeing a lot of keratin, like you had a severe keratosis, but now you're starting to see some activity in the nucleus here. So this is now called actinic keratosis. This is now moving along the scale towards something malignant that you worry about. The picture, like, it's usually rough, correct? The it can case. be rough and, and have keratin, but it almost looks like kind of a seborrheic keratosis right. when you look at it. And here's a close-up, another one that, that you know, the other, Joa probably took this since he's not <laughs> here to defend himself. But pretty, you know, I gotta get a better picture. So next time we get one of these, remind me, we'll take a picture and replace this. But hyperkeratosis, dyskeratosis, and just some increased activity within the, the cell. That's a bad picture. But here's a closer one. And you can see again, look at these little nucleoli on here. So it's getting more active. And here's dyskeratosis, little keratin pearl down here. So these are ones you start to worry about being kind of a pre malignant lesion. Now, now um, so back to back to you again. What are you seeing here? So, um, on, this, uh, on this side, like the upper lid looks like it's kind of thickened, uh, laminogen, curly, shiny, and then the lower lid there's, looks like there's some yeah, there's a indented region there with loss of washing. So 
loss of lashes, thick end, kind of ulcerated in the center. What would your concern be here? Basal cell. Oh, good, good, good. So if you see what you think is a tumor of the eyelid, by far the most common tumor is a basal cell. So if you take 100 you know, lid tumors, 90 of them will be basal cells. And so if you're going to make a guess and you're not sure, just guess basal cells because you'll be right 90% of the time. Now, the second thing, I always, I've got to train you guys for oral boards and for answering in grand rounds. Project. Project. I know you're taught, be polite, don't talk loud, you know, be soft, but I can't hear you up here, so project. And so you could get the right answer and not get credit for it if you, if you talk quietly and we can hear what you say. So project. Project. The second thing is say things with confidence, and I've got to kill Julia about this all the time. Don't go up when you say an answer. So you say, this is so? Because it sounds like you're guessing, and you will not get credit even if you get it right. So even if you're wrong, you say, this is so. You say it with <laughs> conviction, and then if you got it right, great, you get credit. If not, well, you were wrong anyway. So say it with conviction and say it. All right, so this is very concerning for a basal cell. You see the ulcerated center, the raised part of the edges, but look at how thick that lid is. And so this lesion goes right here. This patient has bought one of Patel's specials, you know, I mean, they're going to be not only taking off their lid, but swinging tissue around from over here and putting <coughs> flaps by, and so this is a pretty, pretty advanced tissue. Now, sometimes they can look not quite that advanced, and so this would be something I look at and say, man, that, maybe that's a little cyst, I don't know, but if you look, there's a notch in here. So there's some signs you want to look for. Look at that notch in that little nodule there, you're starting to lose lashes, you've got this notch in you. So that little ditzel, believe it or not, turned out to be a, a basal cell. And what's the most common pattern we see with the basal cells here? What, how do we know this is a basal cell? Palisading. Exactly. So the nuclei line up around the edge, the so-called palisading of these. And they look pretty benign when you look at them. There's no mitotic figures, there's no nuclei, and they really look benign, and indeed this behaves benign. In that basal cells don't metastasize. Now if you leave them alone and don't remove them, they can really, you know, keep growing and dig in and cause lots of damage given enough time, but they don't really metastasize or go anywhere else. So the classic little nodules or fingers of the basal cell with the palisading around the edges is what we normally see. There's a close-up. You see kind of benign looking, large nuclei, scant cytoplasm around them, and that palisading, that little picket fence that it forms around the edge. So when we, when we look at basal cells, we can look at them in a couple of different ways. You can look at them grossly and say, okay, what kind of pattern do these have? And Lee, what's the most common pattern overall of basal cells we see? Nodular. Nodular, or even people will sometimes throw in cystic. Nodular with conviction, or nodular system. Okay. <laughs> See, I don't have to worry about this. Greeks, you know, nobody ever accuses Greeks of like talking quietly <laughs> and, and, and being, being like this. They're always like, ah, you know. <laughs> with conviction, nodular. But, but sometimes people will throw cystic in there too. So nodular, nodular cystic. These are the most common forms you see. You see these large nodules. Sometimes there'll be a little cyst in the middle. But look even at low power. There's the palisade around the edge of the nucleus. So nodular, nodular cystic. Um, Tara, what is different about this pattern? Um, <clears throat> there's not really little cysts anymore. They're kind of like irregular, misshapen. All right, so you see these little weird looking little fingers of tumor cells, and then what kind of tissue is this in between? It's connective tissue. Connective really. tissue. So what pattern is this? Um, the one you need to worry about in basal cells. Oh, uh, crap. Oh, man, I'm giving you guys hints here. You know? <laughs> As I said, it's a spotlight. You know, you're Winston Churchill, how there's an iron curtain descending across Europe. Well. When the, when, when the spotlight's not on you, everybody knows the answer. As soon as the spotlight hits you, that iron curtain goes right across from the frontal lobe. And it's like, what's your name? Uh, oh, I know my name. So it's hard when the spotlight hits you. Tara also only got two hours of sleep one time. 
Okay, well, you're, 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 you're <laughs> if you just saw the urgent person from Idaho. This is called a morphia form, basal cell. Or the other one people might say is scurus. And scurus means um, with connective tissue and you know fibroblast tissue in between them. So the reason why these are, are difficult to treat is there are multiple little fingers of these tumor cells that extend out, so it's not a big nodule. So if basal cells are going to recur, they're going to you know, invade, this is the type that does it because you can't see these. And so when you go to cut out the tumor, you can't see where these little fingers go. Sometimes they'll even spread under the epithelium. They'll call this a pagetoid spread. And so the morphia form, the scurus type, are the worst because you can't get all the edges. Do these have any metastatic potential at all? Still they don't metastasize, but they can locally invade. They can really invade you know, locally. Now, sometimes you can get different types of cell growth with the basal cell. Because basal cells come from a little pluripotential cell that lives along the basal layer of the epithelium. And so not only can you get a basal cell, if you look right here, look, here's a basal cell. All right, Jason, what does this look like down here? They're bigger, they're pinker, there's lots of keratin in them. Yeah, it looks more squamous. More squamous, and so you can get a basal squamous. So you can even get a basal cell with more squamous differentiation, because remember, the little third potential cells at the base of the epithelium can give rise to different types of cells. Less common, but a basal squam, you can get. Now, what happens if you don't treat a basal cell? This is actually one of Rick Anderson's original patients. Stubborn little old lady from the ranch in Nevada. She came in 10 years ago with a morpheiform basal cell. And, and Rick basically said, okay, we've got to do some surgery. We've got to get this all off here. She said, leave me alone. I'm an old lady. You're not touching me. I'm going to go home and die. So 10 years later, she's now 94 instead of 84. She comes in, and the reason why the family brought her in is because it smelled. And she had a piece of Kleenex stuck up here covering this. You say, oh, what's the matter? What have you got here? Oh, I've got this little thing. And so if you look right here, it actually went all the way back through the sinuses. And believe it or not, there was CSF dripping out of here. And so once you let it get to this point over 10 years, that's going to be a hemi headectomy. You can't really do that to take that off. So you say, well, basal cell is benign. It doesn't metastasize. Yeah, but if you let it grow for 10 years, it can cause this. So, and this was a morphia form. So that's, you know. You know, don't let it go that far. All right, um, what are we seeing here, Reese? Um, so it's just a large lesion on the upper eyelid, um, loss of the lashes. Just. And then uh, the surface looks kind of ulcerated a little bit, too. Yeah, so you almost see it's got almost this parchment paper look to it instead of you know, the, the ulcerated look that we have with the face. So what would you be concerned about here? Maybe a squamous cell. Exactly. And so that, that's a, a squamous cell. And if you look right here, there's another way they can look. And so people call this a rodent ulcer. Now, again, in my simplistic way of thinking, I, I thought rodent, it meant like it looks like a rodent took a bite out of it. So that's not, that's not what it means. But that's how I remember these are rodent ulcers, because a rodent chewed on it. You know? So sometimes you get these little focal areas of ulceration. Look at this person, look at their skin. I mean, this is all sun damaged skin. But this is a so-called rodent ulcer. And sometimes they can look like that. So, when you think about the lid tumors, though, um, you know, most common place you're going to see the tumors is, is on the lower lid medially because that's where you get most of the sun exposure. And you can sometimes get them upper lid, but you think of basal cells, lower lid, medial, and medial canthus, because the brow tends to shade us. Now, some of us, I'm looking, we don't have many chromagnons here. So <laughs> some people have this chromagnon brow that really shades them, so they're safe. You know, they're not going to get basal cells. But, Squamous cells can also occur on the upper lid. And so you'll see them, they'll have that little parchment paper look to it. They may even have an orangish look to them. And when you look at them, they're different. Remember the basal cells were blue with a lot of big nuclei and not much cytoplasm. How are these different? Pink. They're pink. They're eosinophilic staining. And you see there's the central nucleus and there's this eosinophilic staining cytoplasm. And when you look at them, what is this stuff? Keratin. keratin. So you get these keratin pearls, keratin whorls, which you see this is now under the epithelium. This is invaded beyond the basic membrane. Look at the nucleoli. Look how active these cells are. Big keratin pearls, keratin whorls. All right, Ashley, what are we seeing here? Uh, this 
this is an external photograph of the right eye. You see the upper lid that looks thickened. Um, and I don't know if that's blood everywhere or if it's just discoloration of the photo. Um, what would your worry here be? I mean, I always worry about a sebaceous carcinoma. Exactly. So don't ever forget a sebaceous gland carcinoma because it's called the great mimicker. So this was called blepharoconjunctivitis. And so you go to the um, doc at the box, you know, what do the doc in the box give you? They all give you Tobradex, you know, so. First of all, a non-ophthalmologist should never be using a steroid, ever, but everybody gets Tobradex. And so they get Tobradex, it doesn't get better. They go see the optometrist who gives them Neosporin, and it doesn't get better. Finally, they come and see you four weeks later, and look at the thickening of that lid. See how thick it is? Those yellow splotches, look at the loss of lashes. This is not blepharoconjunctivitis, but the problem with sebaceous gland carcinomas is they can sometimes mimic blepharoconjunctivitis. They can mimic recurrent chalazia. So you always got to keep a high index of suspicion. And this one is not quite as, as you know, blatant about it. Look at that diffuse thickening of the upper lid. This is again um, my bone brain sebaceous gland carcinoma. Right? And now sometimes they can be fairly well differentiated. If you look, this almost looks like a lobule of meibomian glands. And if you look carefully at them, you can see that there's activity, there's clump chromatin, there's nucleolide. Look at all the little lipid droplets. But this is fairly well differentiated. And so if you get a sebaceous gland carcinoma and it's fairly well differentiated in a lobular, the prognosis is better. If it's diffuse, then the prognosis is really poor. Yeah. Would you? For that, that bloody one, would you have uh, sampled a sentinel node to? You, you may want to. And, and so when you're thinking about nodes, you know, because these do spread, they can spread by nodes, so can squamous cells. The way you want to look at what nodes you want to do is take a, a, a finger and go across the eye with a 45 degree angle, and upper outer goes to preauricular nodes, lower inner goes to subventral nodes. So you can look for nodes. But these can spread, and so these can metastasize. So you want to watch these. In fact, these can be very aggressive. They can be pretty nasty looking. And if you look at this, you know, you looked at the basal cell, it looked benign. You look at a sebaceous gland, it looks malignant. I mean, it just looks aggressive. Look at the nucleoline. And you can see the little mitotic figure starting up here. I mean, this just really looks aggressive, and indeed it is. Here's a close-up. Look at those nice mitotic figures. And then all the little dissolved lipid all over. So sebaceous gland carcinoma is very aggressive. The great mimicker. Don't miss those. And what stain is this? Oil red oats. Oil red oats. You can see it stains the oil with those little red oats. Nico, what are we seeing here? So there's um, the lower eyelid margin. Uh, there is a, a pigmented uh, lesion. No loss of lashes. Okay, so you want to look just like the other things. You look, for, you look for loss of lashes, you look for thickening, you say how long has it been there. And so chances are this is probably a nevus, but you know, you take a picture of it, you tell the person, come back, let's check it again, let's measure it, see what it looks like. And indeed, we see this picture. What do we see in here? So I see nests of uh, maybe pigmented or like brownish cells in the junction between the epidermis and the dermis as long as there's also a couple in the dermis as well. So what do we call this? Um, a compound. Compound needs. So if the benign melanocytes are just at the junction between the epithelium and the subepithelial tissue, we call it a junctional nevus. If you have them both at the junction and underneath, we call it a compound nevus, if it's just underneath, we call it a dermal nevus. Even though there's no dermis in the eyelid, we still call it a dermal nevus just because it's in the literature. Technically, it should be a subepithelial nevus. But the key thing is once the melanocytes lose the connection to the junction, they lose their malignant potential. So the is the natural history for uh, them to come yeah, down? Yeah, exactly. They'll, they'll drop off and then lose their junctional component. For some reason, once they do, they don't become malignant. And can you still see the pigment when it's 
not low or people just have Sometimes they lose pigment as it goes down, yeah. so they don't necessarily look pigmented. Mm -hmm. Don't let that fool you. And in fact, here we see just that case. Here's the epithelium. Here's a clear space of some connective tissue. Here are the nests of melanocytes, some of them pigmented, some of them not. So this is what we call now a dermal nevus or subepithelial nevus. So these guys have lost their malignant potential. All right, so we go back. I see you thought you'd be safe. You thought you were all done. <laughs> what do we see in here? My generation loved the golden glow, the healthy glow of the suntan. And so my generation all had suntans, and so we're seeing an explosion of melanomas because of all the sun worship. So hopefully you guys are smarter than that and wear your sunscreen and so um, So this is a melanoma, and you can see that it's, it's definitely more aggressive than the nevus was. All right, Lee, what are we seeing here? It's not the two dudes, you didn't run into the two dudes. And so. So um, it looks like a very proptotic left upper eyelid uh, that's very swollen, um, erythematous. Yeah, it's kind of doughy. The eye underneath it's okay. It's a very doughy, you know, elevated lesion right there. And so, you know, you say, God, I don't know what the heck this is. I'll do a biopsy and you see this. What kind of cells are these? So. due to an extension of an orbital lymphoma. Would you get lymphoma? And so these are all lymphocytes, big lymphocytes. Now let's go back one more. Now I'd like to show just some weird stuff here. So nobody's, I don't expect anybody to know this one, but if you look at it, it's kind of a reddish, bluish looking nodular thing coming out. Now this guy's been letting it go, so forget all the crustiness around him. But this kind of a, a red nodular looking and we looked at it, it was very weird because it had these big nuclei that almost looked benign, and yet in the middle of it, it had all these mitotic figures all over the place. This was a Merkel cell carcinoma. And so there could be weird tumors of the eyelid because they could be not just the common ones. And I hope they won't put this on boards, but I just want to show you that there is some weird stuff that can appear on the eyelids too. This was a Merkel cell carcinoma. Otherwise, you can get other carcinomas, too. You can also get mucin-producing adenocarcinomas. And these are really cool looking. Uh, these are often, um, you know, believe it or not, there are some little adenoma glands in the, in the eyelid. It's not real common. But if you look at them, you see an island uh, tumor cell swimming in a sea of mucin. This is all mucin here. And these are little adenoma. Has, and this is called a mucicarmine. It's a mucin stain. Sure enough, islands of, of these cells swimming in a sea of mucin. So don't worry about these. I just wanted to show you there's all kinds of weird tumors that can show up in the islands. And so we say goodbye. Here's one of the where they used to build the ships. 
And believe it or not, one of these buildings is left over. They used to build ships here. This is where the Armaments Museum is. So it's actually a 1600, you know, building that was that was um, <coughs> made into the Armament Museum. So this part of it here was is the museum where we're standing in. Here's a model where they used to build the ships to put in right out. Okay, so next week, conj. Please, seven. Okay, so we can get it all covered, all right? Okay, thanks.